Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and, and thank you very much for the invite. Um, yes, this, the title is about host heterogeneities and climate change. But actually, I want to give you an overview of this system, the rabbit and its two common gastrointestinal parasites, and all the work we've done in the last uh, probably 17 years on this system. So I'm going to talk, yes, about climate change, but also I want to touch base on uh, host immunity, seasonality, um, what happens to the free living stages of these parasites, and trying to give you the, the entire story of this system. And of course, climate change. Um, but before to start, I want to stress a couple of things. And first of all, I want to stress the importance of uh, uh, soil transmitted helminths. Uh, something like a quarter of the world population is infected with soil transmitted helminths. And the majority of these individuals are children in the pre and school age. Uh, they are concentrated uh, in developed countries like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Asia and Far East Asia, and a little bit less in, uh, um, in South America. And these children are in need of constant treatment uh, with uh, anti intake drugs. Uh, there's been a major effort by WHO to try to really not to uh, eliminate these infections, but trying to control the, uh, the burden, the level of infection. And there's been a major campaign in the last years um, to try to treat regularly pre- and school-age children uh, up to 75% of this population and trying to reach this value and maintain this value constantly. And this goal is at least to reach this 75% by 2020. Um, we're well far away from this number. Globally, as you can see, we are well below, uh, something like we're just reaching 60% uh, globally. And if you look at uh, areas like uh, African regions, this number is even lower. So clearly, it doesn't look like we'll be able to reach this number by the 2020. Things don't look better for livestock. Again, if you look at uh, uh, livestock distribution, this is uh, a distribution of sheep, goats, and cattle around the globe. This is a density of, the, um, of these different species. But when you see animals, when you see livestock, you always see uh, soil transmitted helminths. So you can well think about while this is the distribution of uh, uh, livestock around the globe, so this is also the distribution of soil transmitted helminths. Um, people have used the anti-alminting treatment to try to get rid of these infections in livestock and in, in a more aggressive way than in humans. And what we start seeing in these species, um, the increase of uh, uh, host resistance, well, parasites resistance to these, uh, to a bunch of uh, drug classes. Uh, it's a serious problem. We start seeing this development resistance more and more. Um, and so my point here is uh, clearly, yes, anti treatments work very well, but we also have this issue. We may see as, uh, the development of resistance getting more and more serious. It's not as bad as in humans, but we start also in humans seeing the development of resistance to some of these uh, parasites and to some of these, uh, um, the, same, the same of drug classes. So we have this problem. We have uh, chronic infections of soil transmitted helminths. They are everywhere. They are very common. anti minted treatments work very well. Uh, they start developing resistance though. So we start having this issue. And on top of this, there is another problem now. Yeah we're facing, and the problem is climate warming. There's been a lot of work done on uh, uh, climate change and uh, uh, temperature warmings. This is one of the many reviews that have been published. This is from Sonia Altizer and colleagues that was published in Science uh, uh, four years ago. Um, and basically, the message here is uh, um, climate warming does affect um, soil transmitted helminths, 
but also many other pathogens. This is just uh, um, some of the potential type of uh, patterns we may expect. If we look at shift in temperature because of climate warming, what we may see the, um, the reproduction rate of the parasites of the pathogen, what we call R0, uh, may be shift towards uh, the new optimal condition. So instead of having the, the violet type of uh, trends, we now may see things shifted to a different temperature optimum. Uh, the dynamics may be the same or may completely change, like the orange uh, line. Um, they looked, as I said, the, um, the R0 of the parasites or pathogen, but also the, the vectorial capacity if, they, if you focus on the vector that transmits the pathogen or the parasites. So clearly things get shift or completely changed because of climate warming. And also, you may see parasites that have a biannual cycle, uh, the one in blue. Now, because of climate warming, they start having an annual cycle. And so the, the frequency of transmission now becomes annual. And so the chance to get infected also increases. And if you look within it, this single year, we also may start seeing things like uh, uh, the optimal conditions for the transmission may be shifted to a different month or, or, or season. So if the, in, in the past, the optimal condition for transmission is, was in the summer, now because of climate warming, uh, that pathogen may not be suitable to transmit the best during the summer, but may become more suitable to transmit during the spring and the, um, and the sort of fall time. So the window of transmission increases but the optimal conditions also changes. Um, I have a problem with these studies, and the problem is the majority of work, theoretical work, modeling work, and empirical work has been focused on uh, exposure and transmission. So climate change affects the risk of transmission because it affects the amount of if you think about worms, parasites on a pasture. Uh, temperature increases, there are more worms, and so the risk of transmission is higher. And the most of the attention has been really focused on this component. How my exposure, exposure to this pathogen of parasite changes with uh, climate change. Uh, but I think there is another component we need to take into account, and that component is host susceptibility. So we need to think, start thinking, how does an individual that is exposed to a parasite react to that parasite? If I'm very good in fighting the infection and I'm at risk to be infected, am I able really to control this infection compared to an individual that is not uh, as good as me in fighting this infection? So what, what I'm trying to say here is, yes, it's very important to understand uh, exposure and parasite transmission, but it's also equally important to think about host susceptibility and how this comes into the equation when we think about climate warming. And so I want to focus on this. If you focus on host susceptibility, and in specific, I'm thinking about uh, immune response, uh, you may have different type of scenarios. If you think about here, we have just simple parasite intensity. This is the mean parasite intensity in the host population over the years. So we get years, at each point is mean parasites, annual parasites in the uh, host population. If the host population has a immune response, is able to develop an immune response to that pa parasite, and if the parasite is controlled by the immune response, even if we are under climate warming, the impact of that parasite on the host population will be minimal. Because if we look at the averages, over time, yes, you may see a small increase in the average number of parasites in that host population, but overall, we don't see accumulation of that parasite because immunity is able to keep everything under control. So we get infected, 
but our immune system is very good in getting rid of the, of the parasite. So yes, the force of infection, the transmission of the parasites may increase, but immunity keeps everything under control. And so overall, over the long term, climate change may not have such a big effect on this type of uh, um, condition. But of course, if there are no host constraints, the, the host is not able to control the infection because immunity is not really effective against that parasite. What we may expect is the parasites accumulate in the host population and under climate warming, this accumulation is even faster. And so this is what we have to worry about if uh, immunity or other sort of constraints are not keeping the parasites under control. But things may change if you look what happens to the single individuals. And so here again, I'm looking parasite intensity and at this point I'm using host age as a sort of surrogate of exposure to the infection. So if you look at July, uh, you may think something like this. Uh, my rabbits are eating grass, they are getting infected, they keep accumulating parasites, they accumulate, accumulate. July is a good month to have a lot of parasites on the pasture. They accumulate parasites very quickly. And also the new response builds up very quickly. And eventually is able to kick in seriously and control the infection. It may clear completely the infection or we may see, still see parasites uh, in the host. But the important point is immunity develops proportionally to the force of infection, to the amount of parasites they get, uh, they get into the host. And everything goes very fast. In May, things may be slightly different. Um, there are less parasites. It's still sort of not a very good season. There are few parasites around. Are not force of infection is low, so accumulation is more slow, and also the new response kicks in more slowly, and everything goes really more slowly. And so the, the clearance also goes more slowly. The important point here is because of the interaction between immunity and force of infection, what you may see here is the shift in the peak of infection uh, with exposure. And so when exposure is very high, individuals get infected with higher parasite burden at a younger age. But if uh, um, infection is low, this peak is much lower and individuals get at this peak at later age. This type of process, this sort of shift in the peak of infection with host age where younger individuals get infected faster with higher parasites is called a peak shift. And I say this is seasonal because it occurs um, among months. Now, if we are under a climate warming, these things can go much faster. And so if you just pick up a month, like the month of June, under climate warming, this accumulation now is happening much faster and the same individuals then in June, years ago, had this type of pattern. Now with climate warming, they accumulate parasites more quickly at a higher intensity. So under climate warming, we may expect individuals to get infected, first of all, with higher parasite burden at even younger age, because now everything goes much faster. So what we may see is a climate-driven peak shift. If the system is not controlled by immunity, then this is the scenario we may expect. Parasites accumulate with host age in a sort of constant or exponential way. And the accumulation is faster during the, the best months for the, uh, uh, for the parasites. So higher force of infection in July, faster accumulation in the host compare May. And if we are under climate warming, this accumulation is even faster. Here, the parasite is not controlled by, by the host, so everything really builds up very quickly. There is no immunity. 
And if we're dealing with some sort of density dependent regulation, well, where the dynamics of a parasite is basically related to the parasite itself, uh, what we may see is uh, this accumulation reaches a threshold much faster in uh, July than in May. And then once you are in this threshold, basically it's just a ratio of birth and de death processes in the parasite's population. And again, if you're under uh, climate warming, this accumulation is faster. So I wanted to test these two different scenarios. What happens to, um, to the parasites if the host is trying to control, to control the parasites and we are under a, a climate warming condition? Um, to do this, I focused on my two gastrointestinal uh, uh, nematodes. They live, they live in the rabbit. Uh, the life cycle is very simple. Rabbits get infected, eating infected stages, larval stages. The parasite develops in the gastrointestinal tract um, into adults. Adult, adults reproduce and they shed eggs into the uh, environment. Eggs hatch, develop, and they move on the grass and the cycle continues again. Uh, the two parasites are uh, one, Graphidium strigosum, that lives in the um, stomach. And these are 23 years of data uh, divided by rabbit cohorts when rabbits were born. Each line is a cohort of rabbits, uh, is a different month. Uh, and the bullet points are um, parasite intensity at uh, rabbits of different ages. So basically what you can see here for Graphidium strigosum, which I'm going to call GS now, is accumulation of the parasites with host age. So it looks like there is no regulation of these parasites and this pattern is consistent for each cohort of rabbits. The other parasites, Trichostrongylus retortiformis, TR, uh, lives in the small intestine and behaves in a completely different way. The parasites accumulate in, with host age they peak and then they decrease in older individuals, suggesting that this clearance is probably caused by uh, acquired immunity. So the one on the top, GS in the stomach, it doesn't look there is any immune regulation. Uh, TR in the small intestine, it looks like it's controlled by host immunity. I started working on this data and I really, at one point, I thought, okay, I can come up with many hypotheses, but I can't really explain what is causing this pattern. So I learned, I became a sort of parasitologist, I learned how to grow these worms, and I took the system into the lab, and we start infecting rabbits with different number of parasites, um, and we start measuring the rabbit immune response. Uh, but before to do that, I forgot, <laughs> Um, we sampled these rabbits for uh, 23 years in Scotland. Every month, my colleague has been going on in the field and shoot a bunch of rabbits. Rabbits are a pest in the UK. They cause a lot of damage. And um, landlords, landlords, they don't want to have uh, the land damaged by these animals. So um, rabbits have been uh, sampled in this study area, and we also collected climatic data uh, from a nearby station. And we've noticed that the temperature has increased of about one Celsius over these uh, uh, 23 years of data, even more. Uh, there's been some fluctuation, but the trend is a positive trend. Um, we've also seen a 3% increase in relative humidity in, in, in the same area. So clearly, the study site is under climate warming, and we have evidence for this. Uh, we related the 23 years of data of all our rabbits sampled, uh, and we related this to this climatic data, and we found that for TR, there's no really any trend. It increases the temperature, but there is no any change in the mean parasites abundance in the rabbit population. There is some fluctuations, but nothing major. For G strigosome, there is a significant positive trend. So clearly, again, there are two different dynamics happening here. 
Um, so we wanted to try to understand what's happening. And as I said, I took the system in the lab and we infected the rabbits with uh, one or two parasites. Uh, here are just some of the results. Uh, we collected immune variables. This is a bunch of cytokines and transcription factors. Uh, we measured also antibodies. Cytokines have different types. It's basically cytokines like interferon gamma and, uh, and um, what is it, uh, Tbet. Uh, they are the, the cytokines typical of the type one response. We also measure the cytokines typical to a type two response like IL-4, IL-13, IL-5, and also Treg regular, regular, regulatory response antibodies bunch of things. And so what we found is in both cases, we do see an immune response to the parasites and the immune response in suggests that there is a typical type two response to worms. So in both cases are consistent with, uh, with what we see in the in other literature. Um, in this particular experiment, what we did was to infect the rabbits, treat them with an antihistamine after a few months, and then re-infect them again. And what we found that was really interesting during the reinfection, we found that for GS, we saw a general uh, down-regulation of the immune response. Basically, that tells me that there is an immune response to GS, but the rabbit is not going out in full blast. There is, and this is not the control of the parasite, so the immune response it is the host. There is tuning down his own immune response. We also look, yes, but there is an antibody response, IgA. Those are the ones in front line. They try really to, to kill the parasite. But again, these values are incredibly low. So all these measurements have been done at the site of the infection. So basically for GS, there is an immune response is there, but it's very, very tuned down. And so this is why this parasite is very successful in invading and persisting and keep accumulating in the rabbit. For TR, the story is different. There is a upregulation on the immune response in the reinfection. And so the immune response is there and is really trying to, to get rid of the parasites. And it's relatively successful. It's able to control the parasite. So there is a new, new response to GS, but doesn't work and there is an immune response to TR that does work. Uh, we also did some modeling of uh, this immune response using a um, modeling approach, um, and it works consistently. Basically, this is an immune response to TR, the modeling of this response, and it looks like clearance is basically driven by a final effect of antibodies and uh, um, and, uh, and what is it? Uh, I forgot. Uh, eosinophils. Um, so in conclusion, for the two, clear type two response to both. A new response is working for TR, but not GS. Uh, we did also look uh, at what happens to the free living stages. And we did a bunch of experiments with climatic chambers uh, where we put uh, um, the eggs of both worms in the chamber. And we simulated different climatic regimes, constant temperature, cycle, day and night cycle, and stochastic, which is still a day and night cycle, but we change the extremes of the cycle. Uh, we measure the accumulated of thermal energy as degree days accumulation. Um, and basically what happens here is that TR is much faster in developing than GS. The functional response is the same, but under climatic same climatic conditions, TR develops much faster than GS. Uh, we tried a bunch of different combinations uh, looking, we used the climatic data from our field side. We tried to combine the climatic data uh, in what we called uh, wet and and hot uh, period. The wet period is the early ones, and the hot period is mo the more recent ones where we see um, the increasing temperature in our study area. 
And basically, we found the same type of results. Uh, in hotter conditions, these both parasites develop faster, but TR develop faster than GS. Um, and this is just to give you the idea of the thermal accumulation in those two periods using cycle and stochastic regimes. If you use a stochastic regimes, the accumulation is higher of uh, energy accumulation. We also look at the seasonality in this hatchability. We try to um, pick up a series of months. We use the climatic data from those months, different regimes, sto uh, stochastic and cycle, same identical story. In better condition, in July, eggs hatch faster, and TR hatch even faster than GS. This was in the, uh, in the lab. I thought, OK, I want to go a step further. Let's take everything in the field. And we replicated, well, we tried to replicate everything in the, in the field with these uh, open top uh, chambers. Basically, on the shape of these uh, cones, uh, you can um, manipulate the temperature inside. And so we designed the shape of this cone to have a temperature inside increasing of one Celsius. Uh, we put everything in the field. Uh, the first year was a disaster. We couldn't get anything working. Uh, it was really not successful at all. So my, my postdoc went out again the second year. Uh, things got better. Um, this is TR, uh, it, and it clearly looks like the, in the climatic chambers, it works better. Uh, the, the worms TR hatches faster, so that was consistent with what we've seen the, in, the, in the lab. G strigosum was a little bit more finicky. It's very sensitive to dry conditions, and I think what happened, these, these patches of feces became dry too quickly. So it didn't really completely work well for G. strigosum. We got definitely something in July, again showing that in July these parasites are more successful in being around. The great news in all these two years of field work is my postdoc came back with a wife, a Scottish wife from, from being there for two years, and a couple of pet rats. So I thought that it was a successful uh, uh, achievement. I wasn't happy with this, and I thought, OK, how about these eggs? Are these eggs attacked by the immune response? And is the quality of these eggs affected by immunity, um, basically, to the egg? Uh, and so I had an undergraduate that did this experiment. She was, of course, helped my, by my postdocs. But she did, again, with the climatic chamber. She, she ran the experiments of over 15 weeks, and she tried to look at the uh, hatchability of these eggs. Yes, the size of these eggs, the diameter changed for both parasites. But looking at the new response on these eggs, we didn't really see much. We measured the um, antibody response in the blood, but also the, uh, the, the fluorescence of antibodies attached on the shell of the of the eggs, and it was really nothing, nothing really explaining these patterns. So it doesn't look that the eggs are affected by the immune response. So at this point, we put everything together. We know what happens in the host in terms of the immune response. We know what happens uh, to the free living stages in terms of effect of uh, environmental conditions. We know a little bit about eggs as well in terms of a new response to the egg. And so I thought, OK, let's go back to the field and use those 23 years of data and try really to combine everything, to, to try to explain why GS is increasing with temperature in the field and why TR is not. And so I had a, a PhD student, and he developed, he came from Italy, he came to visit my lab, and we spent uh, six months working on this model. Um, the model is relatively straightforward, although there are different complicated components. Basically, it's a immune epidemiology, uh, epidemiological models where we take into account the age structure of the rabbit population. Uh, so we not just newborn juveniles and adults, but also each age class. Uh, these individuals uh, are infected. They produce eggs. They shed eggs into the environment. 
the free living stages eggs of the parasites are affected by temperature and humidity uh, and they affect the mortality of these free living stages and we use the climatic data from, uh, uh, from the field station. What is left, what survives, um, goes on and infect the rabbit with the force of infection F. And within the rabbit, uh, the parasites are affected by the new response, uh, some density dependent regulation, basically crowding effect, and also some natural mortality of the parasite. We run different type of models, and uh, the best two models we got are these two. Uh, for TR, the best model that explains the dynamics is a model that takes into account of uh, the new response, which is consistent with our lab work, and also the direct linear effect of temperature on the free living stages. For GS, immunity doesn't come in at all. Uh, what constrain the parasites within the rabbit is uh, a density dependent regulation which is here and also what comes better for these parasites is the impact of humidity rather than temperature and so these results were clearly supported by our lab work um, how about the patterns the general patterns uh, we looked at the force of infection, and uh, force of infection is basically the amount of parasites on the pasture that go on and, and infect the rabbits. Uh, yes, there is some variability, but there is no trend for TR, but there is a trend for GS. Basically, the force of infection increases with, uh, over the years. And how about the infection in the rabbits? Uh, on top is the intensity of infection, real data for TR and GS, and in the bottom is uh, uh, the predicted intensity of infection from the models for TR and GS. Um, the data were consistent, the prediction were consistent with the data. Yes, we do see fluctuation, but no positive trends. So over the years, we don't see accumulation of TR in the rabbit population. But for GS, we do see any accumulation in the real data and also an accumulation, significant accumulation of uh, GS uh, using the prediction from the models. So basically this is, goes back to my point uh, that if the, the, the parasite is controlled by host immunity and you look the mean parasite's intensity in the host population of the, the, over the years, you don't see any accumulation because immunity keeps everything under control. But if immunity is not there, or if immunity is there but it's not successful, then you see an accumulation over the years. So climate warming does affect the parasite's intensity in the host population if there, is, there, there are no constraints, not strong enough constraints. How about seasonally? Uh, we look at the data dividing the predictions uh, into the cold and warm decades. And we decided to do this because our free living stage, the experiments done on the free living stages, show that there is a difference in the hatchability of those worms uh, between those two periods. And so we thought, let's just look at these dynamics divided in those two periods. Uh, this is TR. The first decade is in blue, the second decade is in green, and the only two de decades where we see a significant variation are June and July, the summer months. And here what happens is in both months, individuals during the warm period, individuals get infected with higher parasite bur burden at higher, uh, um, earlier age in both June and July. And if you, this is a, just a different way to look at these data. Uh, here, just using intensity per rabbit cohort and intensity um, peak of, um, age at the peak with rabbit cohorts. So basically, individuals get infected faster and the peak of infection is occurring at earlier age under climate warming. And so we are in this scenario. With climate warming, everything goes faster. And this is 
affected by immunity, interaction between force of infection and immunity. How about Graffitium strigosum? Uh, what we found here uh, was uh, uh, something different. Prediction, again, um, the blue is first decade, the green second decade. Uh, we have age uh, on the x-axis, intensity on the y-axis. And what you can see is basically with climate warming, we see an accumulation of the parasite. Uh, and it doesn't matter in which month of the year you are, you keep seeing uh, the accumulation. And the ones that have the highest parasite burden are always the older age individuals. Accumulation is slow to begin with and then catches up with uh, rabbit age. Uh, and again, if you want to look at this same type of uh, pattern but breaking the data, intensity, here we talk age eight at the peak of infection with cohort, and here a uh, number of parasites uh, uh, bigger than 50 by cohort. This accumulation, this faster accumulation is not caused by immunity. It's just a, a simple accumulation. And so we are in this type of scenario. With warming, parasites accumulate in the rabbits much faster than if you are in a non-warming uh, decade. Okay, the last thing we wanted to look was the sort of sensitivity of the model. And what we did was um, to compare again uh, a bunch of variables in relationship to uh, the force of infection and the intensity of infection. So I just want to concentrate on the top right. Here we have on the y-axis the mean intensity of infection. And on the x-axis you have uh, um, parasites, uh, host immunity against the parasite. And on the z-axis you have uh, temperature. Uh, and so if you look at this, if uh, immunity is very low, uh, parasites can accumulate in the rabbits. Uh, sorry, the, the first one on the top is TR. So par immunity is, is low, parasites accumulate in the rabbits even if temperature is relatively low. We don't see any climate warming. But as climate uh, temperature increases, so under climate war warming condition, the parasites will increase much faster if there is no immunity. But if immunity goes up, there is no accumulation of parasites. There is no impact of temperature on the parasites accumulation. So immunity is sufficient to keep the parasites under control no matter what is the, uh, uh, the change in temperature. So immunity is high, change in temperature doesn't impact the mean intensity of infection. So, in reality, in the immune response to these, to these parasites is not lifelong uh, protective. Rabbits can get infected and reinfected. And often, parasites are not able to clear completely the infection. But just having that enough of immunity is sufficient to avoid the impact of climate warming on the dynamics of this parasite. Uh, and the same can be said for the force of infection. Uh, if we look GS, same thing, mean intensity of infection. Here we have density dependent regulation and humidity. And if density dependent regulation, basically intrinsic dynamics in the parasite uh, control, if this intrinsic dynamics is able to keep the amount of parasites under control, even if Density dependent regulation is very high. Increasing humidity, we do see some infection of the rabbits. And if in density dependent regulation is very low, this accumulation is even faster. So basically what this graph is telling me that at high density dependent regulation, the system is leaking, leaking basically these rabbits are getting infected and this type of mechanism of regulation is not able to keep the parasites under control. 
So between the two, even if it immunity is not fully protective, immunity is much better in controlling uh, TR than density-dependent regu density regulation in controlling GS. And so you may ask, okay, how about these dynamics? The host may contribute to these patterns. And so we also looked at the dynamics of the, of the rabbit. This is the proportion of the different, the three age classes, kittens, juveniles, and adults in the rabbit population over the years, uh, fluctuations, but been, there is no trend at all. The number of individuals in each age class has been, has been pretty constant over time. So there is no effect of a different proportion of uh, rabbit age that causes the pattern I just showed you. Uh, we also look at the phenology of these rabbits when they reproduce. And the window has been pretty consistent over the years. Uh, each line is a year, each curve is a year. And as you can see, the majority of rabbits reproduce between uh, April and uh, sort of September, August. There's been some variation in the number of uh, uh, kittens per female, but let's say that is the window and hasn't been shifted because of climate warming. So this is my final slide. And so I just want to wrap up everything here. And so there are two main messages. Immunity, first of all, immunity can alleviate the expected impact of climate on parasites infections over the years but can also shift the seasonal peak of infection towards younger individuals. So if we look at this, this sort of dynamics as a sort of average across the population, you can say, yes, climate change has no impact on the level of infection of that host population. But if you want to start looking at heterogeneity between individuals, then you find that the younger individuals are the ones that will become more infected with higher intensities because of climate change. And these younger individuals are individuals that have a low immune response, are kittens that haven't developed an immune response yet. They need to be trained, they need to train the immune response to that. So immunity is very low to those individuals. And so this work was done in rabbits, but I want to go back to what I showed you at the beginning. And I want to think always what this imply to humans and livestock. And so it's something that I want to pause. And honestly, I don't have an answer. Um, so my question here is, uh, under climate warming and for soil transmitted helminths, should we treat more often pre- and school-age children just because I'm expecting that in many of these areas with climate warming, there will be higher availability, higher force of infection, and I'm expecting these kids to be infected at a faster rate. And also, if we think about livestock, should we intensify the treatment, knowing that we do see already developmental resistance again against those parasites? As I said, I don't have an, an answer here, but it's something we need to start probably approaching and start thinking about, uh, not just from a, a climate change perspective, but also in terms of evolution of resistance and, uh, and way of treat uh, livestock, but also humans. And in conclusion, I just want to thank the funding body, NSF, and the bunch of definitely many undergraduates that spend a lot of time measuring worms and counting worms. And uh, Brian Borg was the, the major uh, person that did all the field work and is still doing it. Um, he's retired, but he still goes out in the field and sample rabbits uh, every month. Alex did the, the uh, climatic chamber work testing the undergraduates, the, the, the new response to the eggs. Uh, Andrea, the modeling, and Ash did all the um, uh, immunological work, and Adam, big chunk of uh, the parasites work. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, so the immune response uh, is, uh, as I show you, we measure all these different uh, variables. We also look at the histology. There is definitely damage of the mucosa. Uh, the villi, they become shorter. Uh, there is an impact of those worms on the surface of the mucosa. Um, and there is, I haven't shown that, we, we did try just for curiosity. You do see antibodies attached on the worm itself, all around the face, this is where they feed. Um, but clearly, even if you kill, I don't know, 80%, uh, 90% of these parasites in the gut, there are always few ones that are able to survive. And I think is because we are dealing with chronic infections, because parasites have been around for millions of years, there's been a sort of coevolution. This is common belief: coevolution of parasites with their own host. So while the new response is there, is trying to to, to to get rid of the thing, is not completely successful in doing that. Um, we looked at the microbiome in these rabbits. And uh, we did a manipulation of these rabbits. With, uh, we wanted to look at the effects of uh, the infection on the microbe, uh, microbiome, but also how nutrition could affect the way these rabbits respond to the infection. And I was talking with a few students. We put uh, collars, uh, Elizabethan collars, to the rabbit. So they stop doing a coprophagic business. They get a lot of uh, nutrients just eating their own uh, uh, sick uh, uh, feces. And to our surprise, the ones that had only the color had a very rich and abundant uh, microbiome community. The ones with worms uh, were less uh, variables, a less rich community. The ones with worms and color were in between. Uh, and so clearly, there is something to do with the new response, uh, uh, sorry, the, with the microbiome interacting with these worms. Um, I stop there. Uh, there is still a long way to go. We also measure the new response, and there is an interaction. We, we just look at correlations, and we do see um, a correlation with some of these immune variables and some bacteria. Whether those bacteria are responsible of stimulating the new response, or the new response is affecting the bacterium, we don't know. But it's something that it will be nice really to, 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 to follow up on. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. We didn't really look what was happening in those specific, uh, I don't know, years of high intense parasite burden. Um, it would be nice to, to look at those specific years in more detail. We just, uh, we just either look at the data as a sort of annual trend uh, or within the same year, we put all the years together and we look just at seasonality in the dynamics of infection. But yeah, it could, could be really interesting to see what happens at the extreme of those conditions. Yes, yeah. Uh, for all this, the modeling, we removed the effect of myxoma. We removed all the rabbits with myxoma because we do see an effect of myxoma on the worms. And uh, if you look, impact of uh, co-infection, rabbits with myxoma and worms, we only looked at TR. Well, actually, we looked both. Um, basically, if you have myxoma, you have more worms. And so clearly, there is a... The rabbits are able to cope. Probably they're not, they're highly viremic uh, strains. 
but if you are in, co infected and you are able to, to, to deal with this, these two things, uh, having the virus increases your um, TR. There is more trichostrongylus retortiformis uh, abundance. And that is because I think everything is mediated by the immune response. You're trying to get rid of the, the virus, Th1, and so Th2 is going down and worms are going up. We didn't see this pattern in the ones in the stomach. So clearly, probably because immunity is not playing any role. Uh, the impact of the worm on the virus, um, we are looking at it now. And it's it's really tricky question. And I'm looking at the impact of having worms on the evolution of virulence of the virus. And uh, I don't have an answer yet. Uh, the impact of myxoma on the density dependence regulation of the rabbits has been massive because basically the virus controls the population. Each year comes in, it's a very seasonal, it comes in, you see a major crash, and then next year it comes back. Unfortunately, in the last few years, there's been another deadly virus that's been circulating in the UK and in, in uh, Australia. is a Khaleesi virus, it's a rabbit hemorrhagic virus, and it behaves like myxoma. It's basically killing everything. So in our study area now, we basically, we don't have rabbits. All the rabbits have been really pretty much decimated. And my colleague goes out and he said, if I can get a couple of rabbits every few months, I'm lucky. So the, the population now is really under, under the, the, the minimum. And uh, definitely myxoma is able to, to, to act as a density dependent re regulatory force here. Yeah. But I, I love myxoma, it's a fascinating virus. And uh, we're still trying to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. <laughs>